he was now preoccupied only with who God was. He had learned from Abraham, God's friend, that the blesser is greater than his blessings and the giver greater than his gifts. He had rediscovered God and who God is. And as I indicated yesterday, that nearly always can be recognized in the way, the way a man prays. O Lord God of our fathers, art thou our God? I'm citing from the chapter where we concluded yesterday. It's the 20th chapter of the second book of Chronicles. We're only going to glance at it just for a brief few moments, just to recapitulate and recapture the main flow of God's revelation to us of a perfect heart. Art not thou, said he, God in heaven? In the sixth verse, rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? In thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Rediscovered God, the God who is. Art not thou our God? Present tense. And he had discovered that the God who is, is the God who was. And the God who was, is the God who will be. Unchanging. In whom there's no shadow of turning, neither any variableness. No bravado now in the heart of Jehoshaphat. That false dedication that says, I will and I can and you can't and you don't. <laughs> True dedication says, I can't but God can and he will and he does. That was the substance of his prayer. Behold, said he, verse 11, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession which thou hast given to us to inherit. Anything that is legitimately ours is yours that you have made available to us. All that a man is. Available to all that God is. Knowing that all that God is is available to the man who is available to all that God is. That's mutual inter-availability. That was the life of our Lord Jesus as he demonstrated that true humanity on earth for which he as our creator made man the creature. How available was the Lord Jesus to the Father? Totally. I do only those things that please him. How available was the Father to the Son? Totally. He knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. So there was mutual inter-availability, and that's why there was no margin of difference between what the Lord Jesus did as man and the Father did as God. What he said as man and the Father said as God. What he was as man and the Father was as God. When Philip came and said, show us the Father, said he, take a big look. Don't you realize, Philip, that I'm enjoying that relationship for which I made man. I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. He that has seen me has seen my Father. You see, even the words that I speak unto you, Philip, I speak not of myself. They don't have their origin in me. My Father who dwells in me, he does the work. He's the origin of everything I do and say and am. What I do, he does. What I say, he says. What I am, he is. He that has seen me has seen him that sent me. Not because I'm God, Philip, the God I am. But because though God, I humbled myself, was born a human being, emptied myself, made myself nothing, deliberately chose to be all that I as God made man to be without God. Nothing. Nothing. And you see, Jehoshaphat is rediscovering the principle that must govern man's relationship to God and God's relationship to man. O oh, our God, said he in his prayer, verse 12, Wilt thou not judge them? We have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. We recognize now you, God, to be the only legitimate source of those resources that you so gladly make available to the man who's got a perfect heart. Conscious of his own sin and his own bankruptcy, is prepared to recognize that he cannot, but you, God, can. And you're on tiptoe to demonstrate the fact. Your eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for any boy, girl, man, or woman, anywhere, out of any nation, kindred, tribe, tongue, race, creed, class, or color, who's prepared to let you, God, show yourself strong on their behalf. You're not waiting for a man to be man-sized for God, because man is too small. You're simply waiting for any man to let God be God-sized in the man because he's the only one who's big enough for the job. This is a perfect heart. And upon Jehaziel, verse 14, 
came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. He said, verse 15, Hearken ye, all Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. The battle is not yours. It's God's. In response in God's faithfulness, Jehoshaphat's faith, He's drawn upon his resources and invoked the activity of a mighty God. In other words, he had learned that if you fear God, nothing else can frighten you. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You will not need to fight in this battle. Verse 17, set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, guard against them. March! But in the confidence that you are not fighting a victory... But not fighting a battle already lost. As you did when you entered into that unholy alliance with that wicked man, God's enemy, Ahab. You're now celebrating a victory. Already won. And the Levites, verse 19, stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Jehoshaphat, middle of verse 20, said, Hear me, O Judah, ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. So shall you be established. It's the only solid foundation upon you can, which you can safely build. Believe his prophets. Listen to what God has to say. And do what he says. And you will prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness. He had discovered how beautiful holiness is. As they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord, his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise in anticipation of a victory that was no longer to be settled by their prowess on the battlefield, but by a divine intervention that would allow God to demonstrate that as God, he's big enough for the job. When they began to sing and to praise, God set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, which came against Judah, and they were smitten. And in verse 27, we are told they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. Not congratulating themselves on their achievement, but recognizing that it was the Lord that had made them to rejoice over their enemies. He was the only person to be congratulated. A perfect heart that allows God to show himself strong on your behalf. If only in childlike simplicity, in a recognition of our own inherent bankruptcy, we'll lay the table with our needs, stand back, bow ourselves out and bow him in. And with a joyful heart, give thanks to God for all his illimitable resources The God who no matter what the circumstance is, never, ever, less than big enough. Perfect heart. You know, since God created man, billions of babies have been born. But when nearly 2,000 years ago, the world heard a baby cry, it was the biggest thing God ever said. This is how it's recorded, as well you know, in the first chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews. In many separate revelations, each of which set forth a portion of the truth. In different ways, God spake of old time to forefathers by the prophets. I'm reading from the second verse now, the first chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews in the Amplified New Testament. In the last of these days, God has spoken to us in the person of his Son whom he appointed heir, lawful owner of all things, by and through whom he created the worlds, the reaches of space, and the ages of time. He made them, produced them, built them, operated, arranged them in order. He is the God who is. And this Lord Jesus, the one who was in the beginning with God, was God, and by whom all things were made, and without whom was not anything made that was made in him exclusively, 
to be found that life that is the light of men, that which switches a man on and gives him the moral competence to discharge the office for which he was created to reflect the glory because Christ himself living in your heart is your only hope of glory. Because he must, as God within the man, the creator within the creature, be the origin of his own image, source of his own activity, dynamic of his own demands, remember, and the cause of his own effect. And that word was made flesh. He's the sole expression of the glory of God. He is the light being, the outraying of the divine. He is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature. And when he had, by offering himself, accomplished our cleansing from sin, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on high. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us at the end of the age by his son. Biggest thing God ever said. In anticipation of that event as elsewhere throughout the pages of the Old Testament that foreshadowed the coming of the one who would be the substance of the shadow in the 107th Psalm. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. He is good. His mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. For a very good reason. They've got something to say. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He satisfieth the longing soul. He filleth the hungry soul with goodness. In the 14th verse, Psalm 107, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He brake their bands in sunder. And the 20th verse, he, God, sent his word. It was the biggest thing God ever said. He healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Whoso is wise. Verse 43 of that 107th Psalm, and will observe these things. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. At the end of the age, the biggest thing God ever said. When God wants to say the biggest thing he ever said, what do you think he's looking for? Human prowess, ingenuity, business acumen, five and a half inch chin. All he's looking for is a perfect heart for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for any boy, girl, man or anywhere through whom he can accomplish his timeless ends who knows the end from the beginning. Perfect heart. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. Who's going to do that to which he calls you? The one who calls you to it. And if you don't let him, you blew it. <laughs> That's it. That's carnal sweat instead of divine unction. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24. And then in the Philippian epistle, remember the second chapter? Says the apostle Paul, delighting to preach himself out of business. He says, more, more in my absence than in my presence. Work out your own salvation. Live it up because everything that God ever gave me in the day that Jesus Christ invaded my humanity to share with me his resurrection. God gave you in the day that you received him as your redeemer. And he came to take up residence within your humanity. So live it up. Work out your own salvation. Discover how wealthy you've become by virtue of who he is, living where he does. The creator God, restored to the creature man. God himself. It's God who works in you, he says, both to will and do of his good pleasure. Now, if it's God who works in you but to will and do of his good pleasure, what would be illogical about anything that God wills for your life or mine if he is the God who willed it, is prepared to be the God who does it? What would be illogical? Nothing whatever. Nothing. Faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. So what would be illogical about anything to which God calls you if he is the God who calls you to it, is prepared to do it? Nothing. And yet the Lord Jesus said, many are called, but few are chosen. And he's not just there talking only of the unredeemed who'll be lost because they won't embrace the grace of God and claim redemption through the shed blood of our once crucified but now risen Lord. He's talking about every one of you and me right here now. I doubt whether there's one boy, girl, man or woman in this building at this moment whom he hasn't called. And yet so few are chosen. 
Why of the many do you think that he calls us so few chosen? Among the redeemed. Because faithful is he that calleth you who will also do it. And so, so, so very many of those whom he calls refuse to let him do it. And it isn't even that they don't want it done, but they insist on doing it for him. Instead of letting him do it through them. And we talked about that yesterday, for Abraham had two sons. And one was the byproduct of his misguided dedication, trying to do it for God born of the flesh, Ishmael, but Isaac, born of promise. So when God wants to say the biggest thing he ever said, he looks for a perfect heart, somebody who's prepared to let him do it. Remember the story? Of course you do. Luke's Gospel in chapter 1, let's glance at it just for a few moments. So familiar, we need only glance at it. The 26th verse of the first chapter of Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And he wasn't gen sent on a general assignment. Look around and see whom you can find and re make a recommendation. Is that what God said? Take a few angels with you and sit in committee and come up with some suitable candidates. <laughs> no. When God sent his angel Gabriel, he gave him the exact address. He sent him to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, verse 27, engaged to be married, but not yet consummated, and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And the girl's name, probably no more than a late teenager, was Mary. But when she saw him, an angel, she was troubled. You don't see an angel every morning of the week. But angels are very kind from all we read of them in the Bible. He, seeing that she was troubled, said, Don't be frightened, Mary. Verse 30, Thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb. Made this fantastic proposition. For conception in the womb in itself is a miracle because that isn't where conception takes place. That demanded a divine intervention. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Named a boy before he was born. Were you named before you were born? I mean, did your mum and dad send a postcard round to all your friends and relatives and say that on the 14th of May, Horace will be born? Or on the 23rd of June, Agatha? <laughs> no, because they wouldn't have stuck their necks out that far. Because on the day, you see, Horace might have turned out to be Agatha and Agatha might have turned out to be Horace. You probably don't have the peculiar mind that I have, but can you imagine just how embarrassing it would have been for the angel Gabriel, for Mary and Joseph and God himself, if on that first Christmas morning it had turned out to be a girl? <laughs> but you see, God doesn't make that kind of a mistake. He whom thou shalt call Jesus shall be great. He shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom of which there will be no end. He shall be king. Well, that was a pretty fantastic proposition. Thou hast found favor with God. Say, what do you know about Mary before this? Where did she go to school? What do you know about her mum and dad? What trade did he play? What honors did she earn? What grades with which she graduated? Well, you don't know a thing. Not a thing. Save what is foreshadowed of her, unnamed in the Old Testament, when God first made public proclamation of the redemptive and regenerative purpose that had been fashioned in the heart of God, when man fell into sin, rebuking Satan, he said, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and it the seed of that woman, Jesus, to be born of Mary, will bruise your head, he'll destroy you, strike you a mortal blow, but in the process you'll bruise his heel, he'll hang on a Roman gallows, the seed of the woman. We're told 
Isaiah chapter 7, I'll give you a sign, God said. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. The word incarnate, made flesh. And in the ninth chapter, to us us, a child is given, a son is born. His name is going to be called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. And God added, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It won't be of any human explanation. It'll It'll demand a divine intervention. And furthermore, I'll tell you exactly where he's going to be born of that virgin girl. Micah chapter 5 verse 2, Out of thee, Bethlehem Ephrata, shall he come forth, whose days have been from eternity to eternity, because that's where God lives. Now that's what we know about Mary, foreshadowed in the Old Testament in her office, but still remaining unidentified and unnamed. So when did she find favor? Well, as a little girl growing up, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking, looking, looking. And all those little events in a, bo- in a girl's life that to us would have no significance whatever. But God was watching. A state of heart. Not a human circumstance. Not a whether her mom or dad were wealthy or not. Not whether they were brilliant, genius in their own right, so that she might be brought up to be unusually Smart and successful. No, God wasn't looking at that. He was looking at her heart. And again and again, in all kinds of little ways, God was sort of writing in his notebook. (laughs) Here's a little girl who knows who I am and is prepared to reckon with the fact. She's got a perfect heart. She's longing again and again that she cannot, but there's a God in heaven who can. And nobody's... Noticed it, but I have, God says. I've been looking, looking, looking. That's how God chooses. Those who are to be part of his history. His friends. Like Abraham. And finally, God said to the angel Gabriel, there she is. Knock on that door. Her name is Mary. She's got a perfect heart. Not sinless, but a disposition toward God that is prepared to let God be God. And nothing, nothing will surprise her. Mary said to the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Not incredulity, not cynicism. She didn't try to laugh it off. Otherwise, God never would have sent Gabriel to that girl's home. This was wide-eyed wonder. You, you mean really what you say? Well, yes, said the angel. But how? How? Oh, said the angel, if you want to know how, it's very simple. Mary. A simple principle that you've learned as a little kid already to apply. That's why God sent me to you. You have found favor. The Holy Spirit shall come upon you. The power of the higher shall overshadow you. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you will be called God's Son. That's how, Mary. God himself. Oh, by the way, just for your encouragement, it may interest you to know that Elizabeth, your cousin, who all her days has been barren, physically incapable of bearing, and who now is far, far too old to bear. She's in the sixth month, and she too is going to have a little boy. And we know who that was going to be, John the Baptist. So said the angel for the encouragement of this teenage girl. With Elizabeth it's too late and with you it's going to be too soon. Because you see, with God, nothing, 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 Mary, is impossible. And God's chosen you because you've already settled in your heart that you can't. But God can, if only you're prepared to let him and God knows that you will. And she did. Mary said, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Which simply means I'm available. I don't understand it. I couldn't explain it to myself. And least of all could I explain it to anybody else. And she didn't even try. Because once having settled for the issue. She hid these things in her heart. She didn't blather all over the place. And tell everybody that she was going to be the mother of God. She kept her mouth shut. The hardest thing in all the world for most of us to do. That in itself needs God. It's almost the impossible. If she had been exhorted today in the popular 
you know, trend of the age. She had just said, God, I get the message. I'll do it. You leave it to me. You couldn't have chosen a person more qualified for the job. <laughs> and flexing her muscles and gritting her teeth, she would demonstrate she could and couldn't and wouldn't. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me from your direction to my direction, having its initiation in the God of eternity. Be it unto me according to your word. In other words, said she, you said it. You do it. Today we're told that we're the ones who say it and God does it. No, God said it. And God did it. But you know that that little boy might be born at Bethlehem, the biggest thing God ever said. When the world heard that baby cry, that he might come dead on schedule. You see, the God of eternity had already been laying the stage, as he always does. As for those events in your life into which you're going to be caught out into the timeless purpose of God in the measure of your availability to him, as was hers to God in that day. He's already laying the foundations. All kinds of things are happening that you know nothing of. Conversations taking place. Telephone calls are being made. Letters are being written. People are being born and others are dying. So that at the precise moment, dead on schedule, he may accomplish those things through your life and mine for which we have been first created, now redeemed and indwelt by our risen Lord because we have been recreated in Christ unto future good works, a program that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. That isn't sort of pagan fatalism because the story can and will only be told in the measure of your availability and mine. I've come, said the Lord Jesus, to do your will, O God. Hebrews 10 and verse 7. All that has been written of me in the volume of the book. What book? The Old Testament scriptures that foreshadowed his birth, life, death, and resurrection. But in his total availability to the Father, he could, at the end of his days, cry and triumph, finish. Mission accomplished. The story, Father, has been told. And your ambition and mine is that at the end of our days we will have hindered him as little as possible in the story he wrote for you and wrote for me. No issues for him to face, no decisions for him to make. That's why all he demands of us is a disposition, a state of heart that lets God do it. All right, turn back now to the first book of Samuel in chapter 16. For remember, the Bible is a total revelation of an eternal plan that was fashioned in the heart of God. 16th chapter, first book of Samuel, the Lord said to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Said God to Samuel, Wipe away your tears and don't waste your pity. He's a dead loss. I have rejected him. Fill thine horn with oil, go, I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Go to, go to Bethlehem. There there's a man called Jesse. He's got a whole bunch of kids and amongst his sons. God said, I've got a king. I've got a king. Well, Samuel didn't take too kindly to the instructions. He says, how can I go, verse 2, if Saul hear it, he's still on the throne, he reigns, he calls the shots. If he hears this, he'll kill me. And God said, tell him you're going to church and take a heifer with you. <laughs> Aren't you glad you don't have to take a heifer with you when you go to church? <laughs> I mean, think of the spring conference at Prairie Bible Institute. And <laughs> you wouldn't just need a parking lot, you need a feed lot. <laughs> you wouldn't hear the speaker for the mooing. <laughs> Sometimes that might be an improvement. <laughs> But the Lord said, take an heifer with thee, I'm, and tell him I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And thou shalt anoint unto me, verse 3, notice that him whom I name. I name. I'm not asking for your advice. I name. And Samuel did a very smart thing. He did that which the Lord spake. That's always the smartest thing you can do. Because when you're told what to do and do as you're told, something's going to happen of timeless worth. Mind you, the elders weren't too enthusiastic either. They trembled at his coming. Most folks are a little nervous when the pastor calls. <laughs> they said, if you come peaceably, 
He said, yes, peaceably, I'm going to church, and I want to take Jesse and his kids with me. And so they all prepared, and off they went. Came to pass, when they were come, verse 6, he looked on Eliab, and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him, because Eliab, he was a he-man. He was an all-American. He had hairs on his chest like barbed wire. You know, his <laughs> muscles were like elephants' kneecaps. He had a chin like the brow of battleship. <laughs> and Samuel understandably thought, man, if ever there was a king, there he is, head and shoulders above the rest. Fantastic. And God said, forget it. Uh-uh. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature. I'm not impressed. This isn't a fat stock show. I have refused him. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. I'm not evaluating how impressive he is. You know, he enters a room and everybody stops talking and looks in his direction. And the girls, of course, they all flutter around like little bits of fluff. <laughs> God says, I'm not impressed. Whoever may be, I have refused him. Because I'm looking on the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and God said, uh-uh. And then he called Shammah the third and God said, uh-uh. Seven times God said, uh-uh. It was the sevenfold, uh-uh. <laughs> and that was a little embarrassing for Samuel, you see, because there were no more. And Samuel said, you hear all your children? And Jesse said, no, there remaineth yet the youngest, but he's only, he's only just a little kid. We left him behind on the hill to keep the sheep. We didn't think it was worthwhile bringing him. And Samuel said, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he cometh hither. <laughs> now you might imagine that because God said no to Eliab, that fine specimen of humanity, that the, you know, the uglier you are, the bigger chance you have. You're right in the front line. You know, the more nauseatingly unpleasant, the chances are you'll be God's first choice. <laughs> you know, like the <clears throat> young man who took his mother-in-law with him on his honeymoon because she was so ugly he didn't want to kiss her goodbye. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> <clears throat> they went to the seashore and she sat in the sand and watched out over the ocean, sat there several hours and finally the beach attendant came and said, excuse me, madam, would you go home? The tide wants to come in. <laughs> he took her to the shopping center and dropped her there and was arrested by the police 50 yards down the road for leaving the scene of an accident. Now you know, <laughs> you know just how ugly she must have been and you might have thought, boys, she's the one God's going to choose. <laughs> but that isn't true. For David came, verse 12, and he was ruddy with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And God said, I got a king. I've got a king. Arise, arise anoint him. This is he. What do you know about David before this? Nothing. This is your first introduction to a small shepherd boy, brought somewhat reluctantly by his dad. And God said, I've got a king. Because, you see, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, that he, God, might show himself strong on the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect toward him. So when did God choose him? For the perfect heart. Let's look over the page. We only have just a few moments. The Philistines, verse 3 of chapter 17, stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion, Goliath, the giant, nine foot six tall. And the Philistines said, verse 10, I defy the armies of Israel. They say, give me a man that we may fight together. But in all the armies of Israel, there was no man. Just a bunch of frightened sheep. Because it says in verse 24, all the, quotes men, end of quotes, of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him, were sore afraid. 
And they said the one to the other, have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel, has he come up? It shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches. He'll give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Why don't you go? Well, why don't you go? <laughs> and they were amazed that nobody else would go. <laughs> because none of them had the guts. But just about that time, David's dad sent him with some cookies for his three older brothers who had been drafted and some cheeses for their captain. And when he was there, he heard these men of war discussing the giant. So grabbing the leg of one of them, he said, verse 26, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine anyway that he should defy the armies of the living God? I'll take care of him. And if you were to read on the next few verses, you'd see what was the natural reaction of his three older brothers. <laughs> they said, go home, big mouth. Get back to your sheep. <laughs> That's what big brothers are for. Just to persecute little brothers. <laughs> and keep their feet on them. <laughs> but news spread. When the words were heard, verse 31, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him, and David said to King Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. Thou art but a youth. He was a man of war from his youth. You don't have what it takes. And David said to the king, I've got news for you. Thy servant David kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear. And they took a lamb out of the flock. Mind you, mind you, King Saul, when I saw that lion, man, he looked big. Did he look big? And when he opened his mouth and roared, those teeth. But you know, King Saul, after I'd looked at the lion, I looked at God. <laughs> and then the lion looked so small, so I killed him. And you know, then came the bear, King Saul. And you know, that bear learned nothing from the lion. <laughs> Mind you, I'm not saying he didn't look big. Man, did he look big. Then I looked at God. And then that bear looked so small. So I went out to half to him, verse 35. He says, and I smote him. I delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And I'll tell you something, King Saul. As for this uncircumcised Philistine, he shall be one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. But, uh, said David to King Saul, I don't want you to misunderstand me. It's the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. It's that mighty God who delivered me out of the paw of the bear. And it's that same mighty God who will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. I want you to understand, King Saul, I don't have what it takes. But God does. And Saul said, go. And the Lord be with thee. And I think underneath his breath he said, you'll need him. But David had already discovered whom he needed. He'd got a perfect heart. He knew that God was standing tiptoe to show himself strong on the behalf of any boy, girl, man or woman who's prepared to say, I cannot, but God can, and I'm prepared to let him. He took his staff in his hand. In verse 40, he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. His sling was in his hand and the Philistine came on. He disdained him, said, verse 43, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And cursed David. And David said, verse 45, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, Mr. Goliath. You're in trouble. Because you're not going to fight me. You're going to fight him. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, that all the earth may know, end of verse 46, that God's got a champion on earth, that at last he's found somebody on earth big enough to keep God in business? Is that what he said? That all the earth may know that there's a God in Israel. A God that Israel has forgotten. 
And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. That is what uh, Jehoshaphat had to rediscover. Something that had been discovered by his great, great, great grandfather, David. He will give you into our hands. And David hasted, ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, slang. And so David, with a sling, prevailed over the Philistine. He smote him and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Just a mighty God in heaven. And a state of heart in a small boy on earth. One of God's friends with a perfect heart. So that nearly 2,000 years ago the world could hear a baby cry. The biggest thing God ever said of the seed of Abraham, Isaac and of Jacob. The twister, the sneak, the swindler whose name God changed when God found his heart to Israel. A prince with God. That he bearing twelve sons, that of the tribe of Judah and of the house of David, in the city of David, Bethlehem, conceived miraculously by the Holy Ghost in the borrowed womb of a virgin girl, he might come forth, in whom all the families of the earth should be blessed. Dead on schedule, in the eternal timeless purpose of a God who knows the end from the beginning and whose eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth that here or there he might find some boy, some girl, some man or woman who willing to let God be God, show himself strong on their behalf might be the means on earth of his divine ends. God's friends, part of God's history. And you see, before our Lord Jesus comes so much sooner than we would dare to believe, he still has a little business to transact. And his eyes still today are running to and fro throughout the whole earth, through every row in this building right now. And he's not particularly interested how well you're dressed, how much money you've got in the bank. He doesn't want negligence nor slovenliness, of course, because that outward sign might be an evidence of the state of heart within, but where he primarily looks Is on the inside. Looking for the perfect heart that says, Lord Jesus, I'm just a little kid. They only trusted me with a bunch of sheep. But I realize now that all that matters is not how big I am, but how big you are. And I want you to know that all that I am is available to all that you are. And I know that you're never, ever less than big enough. You're a God who's bigger than bears, bigger than lions, and bigger than giants. Any candidates? Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord, for the incredible opportunity that you've given to us as the creature to live daily in the power of the Creator. To know at all times that we're but the earthen vessel, that you're the timeless treasure that the excellency and the power may be at all times be demonstrably of God, the God who can. There are some of us, Lord Jesus, this morning, boy, girl, man or woman, whoever we may be, who would humbly say in our hearts, I don't deserve it. You never said I did. But you made me this way. You created me in such a way so engineered that the presence of the Creator within the creature is indispensable to my humanity. That all you're looking for in me is normality. That normality that lifts me up and out of the animal kingdom by a quality of life and behavior that will know no possible explanation. But you, Lord Jesus, living in my heart, God in the man, I want to be that boy whom you can choose. I want to be that girl. I want to be that man. I want to be that woman. I want to hinder you as little as possible in the telling of the story that you've already written. I want as best I know how at the end of my days to cry it's finished. Mission accomplished. I simply let God be God. 
and he was big enough for the job. Thank you. In your own dear and precious name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon by Major Ian Thomas. If you've been blessed by this sermon, you can find more sermons by him and additional resources on this subject at pathtoprayer.com. Again, if you've been blessed by this sermon, you can find more sermons by Major Ian Thomas at pathtoprayer.com as well as other resources.